Welcome everyone to the final panel in our Coaches and Directors Summit, day three. I hope you all have had a wonderful time listening to so many incredibly talented and knowledgeable experts in our space as they have shared their stories and their knowledge with all of us over the past few days. We have perhaps the best for last talking about the core of what we do, community and building programming around community to maximize our programs and our spaces and those around us. I am joined by three very wonderful people in alphabetical order. First name, will you please go around the horn and give a 30 second introduction for each of you? First name, last name or first name? I'll just, just, go. just, go. I'll just go. Chase, you're first. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Chase Newcomb. I'm the director of esports at St. Cloud State University, super involved in the collegiate space. Um, currently, as of one week from now, I will be stepping down, but I am the chair of the board of directors for NECC. I am the chair of the competition council for NACE. Um, grassroots oriented professional. I do too much Discord DMs open if you need help with anything. <laughs> Thank you, Chase. Cora, you're up next. Hey, hi, I'm Cora Kennedy. I'm the director of esports at Illinois Wesleyan University. I also serve as a DEI director for NECC, DEI committee for Voice of Intercollegiate Esports. I do some freelance publications. I have a new one today, actually. And then I also am a freelance photographer. Thank you so much. And we're so grateful to have you. Jackie, please introduce yourself to the world. Hi, I'm Jackie Lamb. I'm the previous assistant director and head coach for Minnesota State University, and I'm the new STEM and eSports TOSA, which is teacher on a special assignment, which people don't know, for the Minneapolis Public School District in Minnesota. Um, I am a co-founder of eSports and Coffee, a mentor for Wiggy and QWE, as well as a bunch of other stuff. Um, yeah, that's me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Well, we're going to dive so right into our topics of discussion for today. And our topics are around community programming. And Jackie, I'm going to give the first question to you, my friend. Uh, everyone knows that community, as we talk about it, is central to gaming and esports, especially on the scholastic campuses on which we work. So I want to ask you, what do you define is the community that esports on your campus serves? and that you have served in all of your many roles. And how large is this community in reference to the total campus population? I think that's a hard question to answer just for one university. I think when you're thinking about your university, you're gonna think about a couple of things. You're gonna think students, the faculty, the staff, and then the outside sources. So community members, people who aren't involved in necessary the school, but want to be. And then the high school students and middle school students as long as your community. So considering all those factors, if you are a medium sized university like mine was, our community would be our students who attend our online Twitch um, matches, who come to our facility to play in, in the facility and then support us. But then also outside factors for the community when we run Smash events. Um, Smash is very big in Minnesota and Chase will attest to that. Um, but it's <laughs> the outside factors too who come in to support you and that's how you have your community and set it so just figuring out what your gross population is and then putting them into different categories and then figuring out what they can do to help um, support your own program thank you so much and I, I agree with what you said it's very hard to define that within just one particular bucket so i'm actually going to ask both uh chase and cora starting with you cora if you could go ahead and answer that same question um how do you define the scope of community that esports on your campus serves and how large is that community in reference to your overall campus population yeah, so for us, I, I don't know much about your institution actually, Chase, but for us, we're a pretty small college. I have 1,600 students total on campus, and it's maybe a five minute walk end to end, which students still complain about somehow. But for us, our esports program is 45 ish players. I have students and staff involved, but besides that, we're pretty small on campus. We're actually now, the population I'm looking at different is because we're over half athletics on campus now. With our new incoming class, we're over half athletes. So I'm drawing from an 800 student population now instead of 1600. And we also have casual gaming across campus, athletes still get involved. 
And I also look at students who just want to be interested in gaming from the community. We bring in players from high school teams nearby and use our wonderful facility as a way for high school programs to get team workouts and see the campus. So for us, it's going as broad as I can while still fitting in the time constraints that I probably have to deal with. I like that going broad while fitting in as much as you're able to, to serve. Chase, uh, please define community for, for yourself as, as a newly minted director at St. Cloud State University. Yes, yeah, certainly. So a community here is very different than uh, most other spaces I've been in. And I think the big benefit for me and the draw for St. Cloud State for me was the focus on community. I'm, I'm a very community oriented professional. Um, that's my main focus. And so when we were building out what we were wanting our program to look like, which we're in our first semester officially, full semester of our program, it was a matter of, they came to me and said, well, what do you want to do, right? That is very rare in our space. Most coaches and directors are given a blueprint up front and you have to fit your cookie cutter model to that, right? Um, for us, it was a, a collaborative conversation, which I definitely appreciated. So when we were building out our model, community was first and foremost. Um, we're really trying to send out a message of belonging to all of our students on campus. Our campus size is uh, decreased since COVID, but still a, a bit larger than where I formerly was from. Um, it's around 8,500 students currently on campus. And we put out a form um, just very basic asking folks if they were interested in esports, any incoming freshmen and transfers. And actually out of this freshman class, we got 900 responses on that form saying that there were 900 people interested in esports. So for us, community fits into a couple of different areas, right? Community, we have a uh, Mitchell Hall uh, community on campus, which is our uh, esports themed living learning community. Um, we have a all of our clubs on campus, obviously, and those are sectioned out separately by game because they actually get more funding if it's individually by game. Um, and then we have our, our out of those clubs, those smaller competitive teams that are being involved. And then we have our internship opportunities, career opportunities. So really, when we're looking at developing esports here at St. Cloud State, that first stop shop is community and getting involved somewhere and finding that sense of belonging so uh, this year it, i mean any other year i've been involved with collegiate esports it's just been competition and growing the community from competition whereas here it's vice versa we're growing communities first so rather than starting we only have two competitive teams right now smash brothers and uh uh, Smash Brothers and Rocket League, rather than starting a bunch of teams arbitrarily and recruiting specifically for those games um, like Valorant, Overwatch, etc., we're actually looking at our community first. And so um, we have a coalition, and the coalition is all of our separate community groups coming together. And the game specific clubs at the end of every year, our coalition will vote on the club that has had the most engagement, and we'll have a panel sorting through those votes of. Uh, professionals here on campus and we'll promote one club every year to varsity over the next four years so it really is community first and as you're engaged with your community growing your community from there it scales so our model i went a little bit into the weeds but our model is really different um than a lot of other schools and it's because i wanted to come in and really center what we're doing around the community here at st cloud state that's amazing. I, I love hearing all of those different responses and, and hearing how each of you are thinking about this, not just from your program perspective, but also just from your own personal professional views. Chase, I want to ask you to go a little bit more into detail because as everyone here knows, data is showing that programs are increasingly reaching out to students off campus and in, including high school, after school, youth involvement, and so many other avenues and facets into their programming. Um, how does that look currently at your school with SCSU? That's a great question. And it's very true. I mean, we are seeing multiple communities grow up in all of these college communities and collegiate. So for us, um, it's a matter of our internal community, who we have on campus, who is already students at St. Cloud State, and then our external community that's local, being the St. Cloud area community, who is involved 
um, from there. So that could be our uh, locals. Uh, Jackie was talking about how the Minnesota Smash Brothers scene is thriving, and it certainly is. It's it's uh, a big scene. So that's that could be our local Smash Brothers groups. Um, that could be our visitors bureau working with them to engage the local community. Um, and then there's the the a regional community, right? So that would be central Minnesota for us. And so our strategy to attack, I guess attack's not the right word, our strategy to engage each of those areas is really to uh, create some really meaningful opportunities on campus when it comes to events and the spaces on campus. Um, we just bought 20 brand new PCs, uh, 4080 i9 processors, and they're available for Damn. anyone at... <laughs> Damn, okay, That's, you got nicer stuff than me now. <laughs> it's kind of insane. Um, they just bought 20 of them, and we already had 10 3080 i7 processor PCs. Um, and I won't be revealing the brands because we're not sponsored yet. Um, so the we have 30 PCs on campus now, and, and that's available for students anywhere on campus to engage. Um, we have a lounge that has 12 of them, and then our eSports arena has 18. And so tackling our area community, really the local and then our internal community, is really creating those opportunities in terms of event planning to bring them in. Um, and so for us, it, it's a very interesting dynamic because it's so new, right? So I noticed very early on that this was going to take up uh, a lot of time and need a lot of resources for. So I went back to our administration here. I explained sort of the position that I felt that I was in and we actually hired a brand new person. Actually, they're not hired, they're on scholarship. Uh, we brought in Cameron McCall out of Kansas City. He goes by campaign. Um, he's on the PR in Kansas for Super Smash Brothers, very involved in that scene. And he's gonna come on a full ride scholarship actually to St. Cloud State. He started yesterday and he's gonna be engaging our community um, as our community manager to both grow the external community in St. Cloud and to grow our clubs and coalition on campus. Can I just jump wow. in really quick too? I'm so please sorry. go for yeah. it. Please. Um, I just want to state too. Um, off one of the other topics is the staff and the faculty that student workers are. We dedicated a lot to aligning ourselves with other departments, like um the theater department, and that way I was able to send job openings or questions to them, and they would send it to their whole list instead of me sending it to a million students or other people oh. but that's how we were able to get our extra students who weren't necessarily on campus the online students was through student workers who had spouses or brothers or sisters that they were able to pass it on to so really collaborate with your other programs to be able to use their directories as much as possible and that sort of cross campus Absolutely. partnership lets you also find other folks you can work with on campus you wouldn't even know no no first of all like i'm working with our makerspace people now to just do random like we have coasters lying around now that I borrowed for home and things like that. And we just getting makerspace folks or just anyone on campus, like theater departments love getting involved. PR people love getting involved. I'm working with marketing for ideas. So like get involved across campus. You'll find random departments who will just be your best friend all of a sudden and they'll do whatever you want them to do. I'd love to summarize that in, in a very simple statement that's a, that's a takeaway statement for anyone listening, and that is grow your social capital, grow your leadership on campus, yes. get other folks involved like Jackie and Cora are saying that believe in your mission of what you want to do with these sports. That's what um, Cora was just saying she did, I did with campaign, what Jackie said she did. So, I mean, it, it makes sense just grow your footprint on campus and create meaningful experiences for people to want to be involved with. Absolutely. Well, well said, all of you. I want to toss a question uh, to Cora. Um, what would you say is the biggest difference between deliberately programming something for your community and simply being present in that community? So something I talk a lot about with my space on campus is our esports facility is on the edge of campus, which may sound bad, it's a five minute walk, but we're on the edge of camp. People don't see us much. We don't, people don't walk by us much. And a lot of times I say, our space is open, you're free to come by. And nobody really does because we're out in the periphery. People, only people who come by are people who are supposed to be there. And I don't get walk-ins, I don't get walk-throughs. And so to do programming purposefully for that, what we're doing this coming year actually is putting events up in our lobby, doing study times, uh, using quiet space in our building just for that, or putting flyers around campus to say, hey, this space is open, come by this time, do a workshop or learn more about esports or that kind of thing, and being visible. 
being visible around campus helps you find programming you want to do because I don't have all the ideas. I don't know everything that I want to do with the program with the school year. What I do is I take it from students. We are working on a thing last year with the um, Greek life organizations who said we want to run a tournament. Let's go run it. And unfortunately, it fell through due to scheduling conflicts. But those are the things where you talk to you, you talk to departments on campus and just talk to students. What do you want to do and how, do you, how can I help? And then do programming around that because I hate making events where one person shows up and I'm kind of sitting there like, well, this is awkward. So it's a lot nicer when I have multiple folks there and I can actually have people around that. So just talk to students what they want to do and match up that expectation with them. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, before we move on here, I want to just briefly say to those who are watching the stream right now, if you have any questions for any of these incredibly intelligent and seasoned veterans, um, please drop them into Twitch chat and then we can address them as we move on to our Q&A uh, focus at the end of the panel. So if you have any questions, drop them in the Twitch chat right now. I want to move on to Jackie. Uh, I want to talk about the school year. First, so in context of our typical academic year, for you and what you've seen, what types of programs coming out of your esports program are most successful at engaging and impacting students? I think Core hit on a lot of the basic things that you want to do. Um, so MNSU has last year just under 16,000 students on campus. and. The school, the College of Nursing was one of the biggest colleges. And then the school of business was a second. Um, and they have to have a, a college of business fair where um, programs and departments on campus can come and set up a booth and offer them jobs or let them know. So that was one of our biggest impacts is that we had so many students that were required to come to this fair for their class. And then they came around and they had like a bingo sheet like talk to 13 booths and it, you give them a stamp. So we were interacting with students who still had no idea going on our fourth year that we had a varsity esports program. And a lot of them were engaged and wanting to participate or even just wanting to come down to the facility to play in between classes. So I think that was one of the most impactful things is being able to be a part of those um, college programming that we were able to attend, but then also setting up side events for our students specifically that aren't part of the program where they could come into our facility and participate and play after hours and just have fun. Our welcome week um, is very impactful where students are able to come play board games, they're able to come meet new, meet new people um, and just kind of interact with our varsity players who we ask them to attend just so that they can kind of interact with each other, but it's not required. Um, usually they do just because they want to meet other people. Um, and then again, smash events. Smash events are so big on our campus, um, working with the music department to kind of create a similar event where we could bring students and the community together. So I think trying to figure out what your community is really big on. Some schools are really big on Valorant or Rocket League, kind of hone into that and then create an event specifically for your students so that they are able to have that kind of vibe and that experience without having the dedication and the commitment to a semester long varsity commitment. So if I were to take that and dive down a little more into what you just said, what I'm hearing from you is that as an esports, you know, coach and director, you're saying that your programming is not 100% esports events. What would you say is is a healthy balance in terms of what you're trying to create and you're trying to achieve uh, for your program and and visually with an awareness? Um, you know, is there a healthy balance between these community neutral events that you're talking about, whether they're study hours or whether they're you know food nights or or anything of that nature, and a come in and play in this structured tournament or or game night that we are doing. Can you can you go a little more into that? Yeah, depending on how many f staff you have on, because if it's just yourself, I wouldn't get too heavy. I would maybe plan one a year, a winter semester. If you have yourself and another full-time or three to four student workers who are part-time, I would consider um, two a month or one, a, one big one a semester where you have a large um, so we had a large smash event where we collaborated with another department that takes time to do the event, but it works for 
both semesters and it's large enough for the community. But then also smaller either bi-weekly events that you can host if you have the capacity to do it. Don't try and do all this by yourself if you're only one person. You're going to burn out because with all the matches that you have, all of the, the practices, just everything you're trying to do as a head coach and a director, because those can be considered two different things. You need to figure out what your own bandwidth is before you try and add in the community aspect every month. And if I could echo that, I actually, that, I would also say, like, be mindful of, yeah, be mindful of your, how much your community, community things, because community is great, but look at your base level operations first. What's, what's your day one operation? What has to happen day to day? What's obligations? And then you look at free time outside of that. It's very dangerous to say, yeah, I'll fit this thing in at night tonight and I'll take tomorrow. I'll, I'll come in late tomorrow. And then you just won't. And then you'll end up working later and later and later continually. And people who program a lot of community things end up putting in like 80 hour weeks and not realizing it. <laughs> and so do not just jump. Well, I want to do 20 things this semester. No, settle in first, know what you want to do and then go from there. Absolutely. Um, Chase, I'd like to actually extend this question to both you and Decora within how the two of you operate as you're both very community minded people. What is the breakdown between I am hosting this thing for students and it is non gaming related or is gaming light and I am hosting this thing for students and it is esports related. What's that? What's that breakdown, if you will? For us, so the community kind of club on first. campus is pretty light. <laughs> yeah, I know there's a delay here. For us, the community club on campus is pretty light, and esports already contains most of the gamers that would be want to engage on campus for us, given how small we are. So what we do instead is do a lot of team building and kind of community stuff inside the team. Team dinners, hey, who wants to go to the dining center for this? We do boot camps and like after scrims and stuff. Hey, you want to get dinner, that kind of thing, or win a big match, go grab ice cream, whatever. Just celebrating accomplishments and achievements with more community building things but for specific non-esports community things for me it's really just making our building available to other departments on campus like athletics is doing some online testing form thing about who's he wants it right now called impact testing and they need a computer lab i'm right here and i'm in the same part of campus as they are so that's how i get more exposure for our building and for our program without necessarily having to do a whole lot Yeah, so to, to piggyback on that, I would say that we host, even in the uh, past couple of months, because our arena was, uh, we, we, we opened it back at the very end of April, so it's only been open since the summer, um, and we hosted a couple of events on campus, uh, esports related, uh, North Star being our flagship Super Smash Brothers and fighting games event. Um, that was our event, we hosted it, ran by our program, operated, everything was us, um, versus we hosted uh, the uh, MNCS finals, which was uh, the Minnesota Championship Series. They're one of the largest Rocket League grassroots communities actually in the country, and they hosted their finals on campus. We had our space open and available, and we were more opening up our space for them to come in and run the event, right? It was esports related, though, in that, in that regard. And then literally a, a week after, we hosted MNLC on campus, which is the Minnesota Learning Commers. Um, it's a massive group of educators that came to campus. There was probably 150 educators um, on campus, and we hosted a pre-event party. It was the first event in St. Cloud State's history to have alcohol, and our esports arena actually Ooh. has a bar um, and we got a license to, to sell alcohol at the event. It was everyone was of age, of course, but um, it was non. So it was in the arena and we did esports stuff, but they asked to throw up some videos or listen to some music and we could obviously accommodate that. So I find now um, when I was at my former university, there was a lot of development, I would say, that that wasn't even esports related in how I engaged my students. Um, we had professional development every Friday and our spring boot camp was actually geared towards uh, ensuring that you were ready for getting an internship over the summer or a job. So we had a lot of workshops, um, people doing resume building, uh, cover letter building, website building, um, sometimes even uh, uh, 
some casting reels, production reels to prepare them uh, for their career. So I, I, I see it as like a Venn diagram, right? So it's esports and what what does everything touch? What what are we involved with when it comes to esports and how can we be affiliated in one a way that makes sense and two a way that's meaningful? So it depends from place to place. At St. Cloud State now, since it's so new, everyone wants to do esports related stuff. And no yeah. one knows that I just like playing ping pong. I, and I haven't had the ping pong club reach out to me to do something fun yet, right? So it, that, that's a bit of a challenge, I think, for any university that's starting. Your first year will probably be a lot of esports heavy things because everyone's excited and you need to match that excitement. But eventually, as well, you should show your adaptability of your space and how you can utilize it for other really creative ideas. Absolutely. Before I go into the nuts and bolts of, of further parts of programming, we talked about just the, the academic calendar. It would be inappropriate to gloss over the summer. And there are so many different things that programs are doing. Um, in fact, many of you have done uh, this magical sentence called summer camps. And so I'd <laughs> like to start with you, Cora, and ask, how do you reach your students whether they're part of IWU or not part of IWU, how do you reach them during this off season? So summer camp for us is a little twofold. So summer things for us, for our players involves scrims for teams who are available, but a lot of my players, because of how heavily internship involved Wesleyan is with our seventh and nation job placement rate, our students scatter to the wind the second the summer hits. I had to find a place for our players to play well, she was at an internship in Pittsburgh to play NECC Nationals. And I contacted schools and got that hooked up. So we do still play match in the summer, but also we have scrims happening for new teams. Our Overwatch team was scrimming throughout the summer and getting to know each other despite being across, I think, five time zones. Yeah, five time zones. Uh, one of them is in Anchorage. His ping was hilarious. So besides that, we also do summer camps for the local community. I actually have players, or players, I have kids for the summer camps fly in from out of state to be in our camp. Because Grandpa and Grandma live in Bloomington, he lives in LA, he wants to be in our camp, and he's been a repeat camper for three years now. But our summer camps are geared towards middle schoolers, who are camp-specific things, and both myself and my coach Matt, have, or assistant director, have a lot of experience with summer camps given our experience in scouting. So camp is a very comfortable environment for us, and while it is still 30 middle schoolers screening my facility, there it's productive. We go through a lot of leadership and teamwork things. We do gaming blocks, of course. We do game skills. Uh, Matt and I taught Valorant and Rocket League again this year to help our students. I do engage some students as summer camp counselors for us. They're paid, of course, student worker employment uh, uh, wages, but they're camp counselors. And they say they don't like kids, and yet they have like a fan club by the end of it. So we have a full summer camp cadre. And something I added this year is I did a game specific camp because our camps are usually pretty broad and just general esports experience. But I also added a game specific thing because in our first and second camp sessions, we saw this huge, huge, huge like desire to play Valorant. They would ignore most of the things we're trying to do and open up Valorant inside, which was not great because I want to do things, but it led us to an, another Valorant camp and I can do more of those things in the future of game specific coaching specific competitive focus camps instead of just experiential things. So if it's a multifaceted approach for us, it's not just players for us, uh, for us, not just community, it's a mix. Wonderful. Thank you. Chase, Jackie, would either of you two like to add on to comments on summer programming and in particular, how are you using it to reach students, whether they are existing students or perhaps future to be students? I'll hop on before you say anything. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> first, I think when you're thinking of trying to do a summer program, you need to start planning ahead of time. So ours ended in June and hopefully now, even though I'm gone, they'll start planning it um, right at the beginning of September so that you can release all or most of your information by January, February, because that's when the YMCA releases all of their summer camps. That is when parents, I just found out, I tried to get my daughter into summer camps this summer <laughs> is that they all fill up in March. So I couldn't do that. Um, she's only four, so it's okay. Um, but that's when parents are looking in by March is to plan out their summer vacations. So make sure you're planning that. Um, but then for Minnesota, we're lucky we have uh, MMVL that um, you, the 
college directors and coaches can get an invite into to recruit. And then you could chat with their advisors for the high schools. And that's how I was able to reach the high school and middle school students throughout the summer is I've collaborated and made an entire uh, Google Sheets of all the high schools within that. And not all of them have their information on there, so that's hard. Um, but then just sending DMs, hey, here is our summer camp. Do you want to have your Rocket League team come down and participate? So it was both middle school and high school over the month of June and just being able to reach out to them through Twitter. So I highly recommend if any high school directors or advisors, yeah. coordinators, make sure you have a Twitter presence or some way to get a hold of you because that's still a gateway that I think we're all trying to push through. Oh boy, summer programming. Um, <laughs> so I have very strong feelings on on summer programming when it comes to esports because I think um, it is a double edged sword. It could be used to benefit your program, or um, and you'll come to find uh, the people in the space. Everyone makes mistakes. It could hurt your program. And in my opinion, I think for this semester, our summer programming, we we had a lot of accomplishments. Um, we hosted five events on campus over the summer, and I mentioned a few of them. Um, the Rocket League event, MNCS, North Star, the Super Smash Brothers Fighting Games event, um, as well as MNLC. Prior to both of our major events, we actually paired our camps with the events. So on the Friday, we had an, so before North Star, the Friday before we had a management camp, and we invited anyone that was participating in the management camp to shadow volunteer the next day for free, um, meaning so they would come in for the tournament, and if they were really interested in being a TO during the camp, they could shadow TOs and watch how they actually operate in person and how that works, because as we know in esports, you really don't know if you want to do the thing until you do the thing. And so that that was the whole point of the camp, is getting students involved and, and letting it be sort of a taste of what that looks like. Um, so we hosted five events over the summer in total, and that was 300 people on campus. It was a, a huge accomplishment for us as a, as a program. And school starts tomorrow, and I have nothing ready. I will be completely transparent with everyone on this call. Uh, everything is taken the back burner to all of the summer events that we had and everything that we had to host. So if you're a new program, if you're starting a new program, even if you're an experienced director like me and you go somewhere else, take that first summer and plan, right? If, if you want to do an event or two, that's totally fine. Don't do what I did. Don't do five events. It is not going to help you when fall comes around. Um, unless if you're an expert planner and you, and like Cora said earlier, you don't value you your are. work life balance. <laughs> I am, but it was, it was still fine. tough. <laughs> right, sure. Uh, but, but in that sense, I, I really think that when it comes to planning summer events, there's a lot of things that you can do right. And, and I'll say our summer events were all, all great. And I think we did an amazing job with our new teams that we brought in. We were able to do some stuff that we see at Esports Nationals. So like for instance, our content team worked over the summer. Um, that's a videographer, a graphic designer, a uh, content manager, and an editor. And they actually were able to clip Smash preview highlights before the players play on stage. Uh, they take like a five to six second video. And they did that for North Star. And it usually takes Vince a couple of go-arounds before they're able to implement something of that caliber. So we had a lot of accolades, I would say, over the summer, but going into fall, it really kept pushing the planning back. So what I would say is it's important to not just plan your next three months, project what you're going to be doing project wise. And, you know, we always say plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead. But realistically, write a wish list of what you want to get done and then start assigning how much time you think that it's going to take to do that. It's really going to help you out in the long run. As an example, so so I'm going to tra track that moving forward because what we're going to do moving forward I think is very different. There is no land centers in St. Cloud. Nowhere. You cannot go and rent or play a PC anywhere in St. Cloud. Um, the closest that we have is a card shop downtown. So next summer, we're going to open up our arena to the local community. And I don't have any rates off the top of my head quite yet, but we're going to open it up for a very low rate for high school students and community members in the area to come in and use our facilities um, and, and operate it like a land center. So there are, it, it's 
custom fit to what your university needs are. Um, a lot of universities are recruitment based, so obviously holding camps has a lot of weight to that. Um, opening up your space as a land center over the summer could have weight to it as well. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for summer programming. Make sure it's meaningful and piggybacking off what the other two said. Coordinate with your local high school groups because they want to be in the know for stuff like that. Good luck. I think that was very appropriate to add. <laughs> in the the asterisk on um on time management is definitely very important um let's move on i want to ask and let's go now that we've established a good foundation in this conversation let's go a little bit deeper uh, into what we might call the 102 of this discussion and this is the red tape and bureaucracy that comes that we all suffer um, possibly when we are doing community programming and i want to ask each and every one of you and I'm going to start with Jackie uh, for this one. How much freedom or restriction do you typically get when it comes to these types of programs for students? How often have you run into the phrase, it's not your job or it's not your department? How does that impact you? I don't you think I, I ever do? ran into, it's not my job, it's not my department. It was more of what can I think of and how can I pay for it? Um, yeah. I. I actually, I had it very nice. I had a very good working relationship with my botch boss, which is Mitch Wallerstead. And anytime that I thought of something or a new event that I wanted to do, I would just shoot him a message. Here's what I'm planning. And then we would collaborate the pros and cons of it. And I don't think there was an event that I thought of that we didn't do. So I, I don't have the red tape that a lot of people had. Our university was very pro esports and anything um there were a couple things a couple lands that we couldn't go to but that wasn't specifically red tape it was due to it was over 400 miles and we had to have more than one full-time faculty staff member that wasn't a student i think that's where my red tape came in is that we couldn't attend lands that we wanted to because we only had myself as full-time um i literally i was in the process of planning an international tournament with chase um still hoping to make it happen but I was very fortunate that I didn't have a lot to, a lot of pushback. So, sorry. You're fine. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> okay. I'll oh, go Chris is gone. Take it. No, Take it. Chris. Um, <laughs> I can, yeah, I'll do this. So, essentially, with this sort of thing red tape for us looks a lot like budgetary things it's not no you can't do this it's can you fit it in your both budget and schedule because for me i gotta work on transportation i gotta work out housing food all that jazz but i also have to make sure i have staff myself and my coach can only go so many weekends before we eventually collapse and so you have to be mindful of how many weekends we can actually take to do events and hey does this fit in student schedules too because one of the red tapes that I deal with is there's some events I wanted to go to that students weren't available for. They had internships going on, they had family things, they already had this this thing planned, and these kind of things get in the way, but it's also life. So the biggest red tape for me is honestly just budgetary, but also trying to handle just making sure students are available and able to do things that I want them to do. I also don't want to ask too much time of them. My whole goal is asking for 15 hours a week at most. If I'm asking for every weekend, that's kind of breaching how much I think is reasonable for them. Yeah, I think that highlight of, of how much time one can spend is, is really important. You know, one weekend is coke, every weekend probably not so much. Chase, on to you. Yeah, when when I've I found whenever you are um, looking at new jobs, right? We see a and I bring this up because there are an overwhelming amount of coaches and directors that um, look for employment elsewhere, whether it be in the space or out of the space after their first couple of years doing it. And, and so I bring this up. This is questions you should ask when you get to your university, right? You, sh you know these questions to ask in the sense of um, what are my responsibilities? What are my expectations? And what can I, what am I capable of doing right what can i reach out and do what departments can i touch and collaborate with and so on the restriction side of things when i was at my former university it was restrictions galore i was told all the time that's not your job don't tell them how to do their jobs um, i had a very 
The biggest example being uh, we had won multiple championships back to back and had come up uh, in nationals uh, shy short uh, just one map away of winning nationals it was a four hour long overwatch set and it, we were exhausted and a week later the athletics department put out a um a write-up of the semester review for all of athletics and not one of our players was included in that write-up even after winning awards and being considered um, as all americans in a couple of different conferences um, and it is frustrating, right, to, to put that much work into a program, whether it's on the coach's side, on the director's side, on the student side, and not see that engagement reciprocated from the university. So keep door knocking is what I have to people that have a lot of restrictions. That that's what would be my piece of advice is just keep knocking on that door. Mm -hmm. um, for Freedoms, when I moved here to St. Cloud State, um, that was part of why I wanted to move here because it was a very collaborative opportunity. I honestly have more freedom than what I know what to do with in the sense of I have departments all across campus wanting to work with us. And at this point, I'm like, how do I work with everyone? Because there's so much going on. And it's a good problem to have, in my opinion. So in terms of freedom, Minnesota here, where it's at. <laughs> Minnesota where it's at exactly <laughs> so in terms of like freedom you can really gauge that I, I think from your initial conversations I mean bring it up in your final round interview and ask them if they're considering hiring an assistant director or full-time coaches and based on that response of how much they're willing to invest into the program that's gonna be a measure of how much you're gonna invest your time into the program based on what they're doing. So I, I think that it's uh, something you learn with experience, but uh, I've had a lot more freedom now because I recognized my prior restrictions and moved in that direction. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to another question, but I think that what you brought up, Chase, is a perfect segue uh, to this question. I'm gonna start with Jackie on this one. How have each of you measured success in your program because within the worlds of, of the university and in academia we are measured by the by outcomes and they may not be what you know our peers or cohorts or those looking from the outside may think so let's talk about measurements of success and how your peers and, and colleagues have uh, have measured those programs and how you're asked to report these these community programming events uh, back to your university I think growth is one of the number one measures of success, um, starting off with, because our university is at the size it is, so with 16,000 students, starting off with only one to two teams, and then growing to our second year, we had, uh, I think, eight or 10 teams, which was a little much for us. Um, but just that growth between our first and second year, I think that's a measure of success. But then also we're education first. So continuing having students who are progressing through their education and graduating. I think it's really important that our students are able to attend our university and did get a degree and they're not wasting money because we don't offer scholarships unless it's financial. So it's really important that if a student is here that they're not wasting time just to play. And so my perspective on it is probably vastly different than other people, but that's fine. But that's how we measure our success is our students are progressing while being able to play. Um, we, we have students who are um, getting experience within our program who want to work in esports after. So I think that's another measure of success is getting them the experience that they need to move on after they graduated. I just had a reference review today or yesterday i can't remember for one of my students for a director job and i think that shows that he has the ability to move from graduating into this position because of the experience he has so i think those are the measures of success that i personally look at chase or Corey, you want to go next i'll go next I'm gonna take I'm gonna take Thank it from Cora this time. <laughs> so once again, this is uh, so interesting for me as a question because it it varies based on where I was, and I'll talk about where I'm at at St. Cloud State in the sense of measuring our programming. And I'll say as a base uh, to to echo off of what Jackie said, 
my number one goal with anyone coming into my program at any university I'm at is to help them achieve their goals, which is generally if they're coming to college to get a full time job and start their career. So at the end of the day, no matter what, all of the tickers move in that direction. That is the end goal, end result for everything we do. So that's my internal measurement, I would say, of success for my program. I am very proud, and as most directors are, to talk about my students that move on in the space and end up working in esports or even working in an affiliated career, un unaffiliated career, but esports being the vehicle that helped get them there. How we measure success at St. Cloud State right now in terms of our programming is very easy, and that is numbers of bodies that attended the event. Um, and it, that's because we're a new program, right? Campus is still seeing what the involvement looks like and how engaged the student and uh, campus population, including faculty and staff as a whole, are. So when we held our eSports launch event for our eSports arena back in April, um, we saw 200 people on campus come out for that event, event both students, staff, club leaders, um, Mitchell Hall community residents, um, it, it was across the board. So that would be our main measurement of success, I would say, by our uh, administrators and peers is how many people came out. The secondary being the obvious, which is the quality of life of the event. Um, how much of a good time did they have? Um, was it easy to understand? Were there people guiding them through what was going on? Um, I think that those are our biggest measurements right now for programming. Gotcha. And then I would echo that myself with the, especially attendance is kind of a big one, bodies and seats is how a lot of things are measured on campus. But then looking at an overall campus perspective of how a program is measured in success, it is number of events as well as attendance. If I do one event with okay attendance, great. But looking at the stats in our annual reports, like we have departments running events daily. If it's student, student inter, uh, involvement who do things with hundreds of students every time. So as a program, you look at number of events you do and then quality of events. If I get a hundred people there, but they kind of hate it, not really much from point. And so like whenever we do big efforts, like our big tournament, Power Pummel, we did partner with the F4. They, the student population was happy, the administration was happy because it was done seriously. There's a serious effort being put into it and it was being taken with the correct level of interest from staff and students as well. I'm gonna hop on really quick too, because <laughs> I always forget stuff. Um, but Chase, was you were just saying before that you're creating your land center for the summer. I think that's a measure of success that you're gonna have next year for your university to show the amount of PCs are needed with the amount of community and high school students that use it. You're gonna be able to show your university that it's needed for your community. And I think that's a measure of success that we can all attest to for our students want to play in our facility and a lot of them aren't big enough, so we need bigger ones. So being able to show that your facility is constantly in use, is constantly needed more PCs or bigger space updated, I think that's also a measure of success. I, I, I should have clarified as well, and I also forgot something, Jackie, which is the, the number of people attending your event, uh, it is... That, that number is so important for us because that number affects everything else. It waterfalls from there. So we use Power yeah. BI, which takes metrics and analytics from those numbers. So it'll track how many people, if, if someone has showed up to four esports events over the semester, it'll track their engagement as an esports member because they're not just going to one off esports events and then not being engaged from there. They're attending uh, Overwatch tryouts and our Rocket League finals and all of these other events. So it gives campus a great metric and measurement of who is part of our esports community versus who are friends of people that are in the esports community. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to bring up. Um, we're in our last 10 minutes of this, so I'm going to go to two final questions, and these are both going to be uh, roundtable unless we see uh, any any wonderful questions in the Twitch chat. So if you have any, any questions that are burning in regards to community and programming, please drop them in here. Otherwise, I think there have been a number of knowledge bombs that have been dropped already, and I want to keep that train coming. Let's talk about high school. We've touched on it a little bit uh, throughout this, this hour. Um, 
please define for ourselves uh, and for the audience uh, the importance to you in terms of interacting with and reaching high schools directly or through third parties, however you choose to do so. Um, and what are some of those short examples on how to authentically connect with these institutions? I'll start. <laughs> Um, I love the third party um, platforms that I have used, but I personally like better to reach out phone, email or discord to my local high schools to set up a phone call with them or a zoom or a discord call with them personally and then with their schools. I think you're going to get a much better dis or a much better connection with them and communicate one, what your program offers, two, how you can collaborate with the high schools. I think the high schools are still so scared to, especially just in our area. I don't know if it's something, so, but I feel like the high schools just aren't aware or know that they can come to the, the local school, the local colleges to come play at. And we've all said it, that we want to make room for them. We want them to come play their finals. We want them to come watch our teams. And that's how we're going to get those recruitments to come through, but also um, just showing that we're there for the community. And so I'm. that's what I try to work on is personally inviting the schools to come down. And Minnesota, um, obviously we're like a long state, but it Mankato is in a weird spot. We don't have as many local high schools compared to Minneapolis or St. Cloud. So trying to get people to travel down, it's a little bit harder. You have to give them incentive. How many hours are they going to be there if it's for a half an hour? It's not going to be worth it. It's going to be hours where we're providing them some nice little swag or a pizza party, giving them opportunities to play on our PCs. I think that's something that they'll want to come down. Um, our longest trip, I think, was three and a half hours. We had a uh, someone at the very top of the state drove down to use our facility. I can kind of speak next to them because I've been there. A... Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I bring a really weird perspective because I'm formerly a teacher. I ran a high school team for three years, and now I've been at Wesleyan for going on my third school year. So I have that perspective of when I was a high school teacher, I was banging down doors, yelling at coaches, please come to recruiting visits for us. I think Chase is one of those, actually. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it was included, actually yes. Chase. <laughs> um, I was like... There's coaches who I met when I came to the industry in, in collegiate who were like, didn't I meet you two years ago when you were at my school? I'm like, yeah, you came to my school and try to get my students. So as a high school teacher, I would bang down coaches doors if I had the opportunity because some state leagues are really developed. Get hooked up with your state league, not play versus, not HSCL, get hooked up with your teacher run state league. IHSCA is Illinois. Uh, I, IEF is Indiana, uh, MNVL is wonderful in Minnesota. I think you both have seen them before. There's uh, WESA is awesome Wisconsin. They're hosting their state finals on December 2nd. I'm going to that. Uh, Michigan's wonderful. And like, for some reason, Midwest is packed full of high school leagues. Um, I think every big high school league besides Texas is in, is Midwest. So- Texas. Yeah, Texas is wonderful. I love Danielle and the whole crew over there. But like, lean on your your state leagues, and if they don't have one, consider contributing or being a part of one. Also, uh, I'll get yelled at if I don't m mention Moseth in Missouri. Sorry, um, but like, talk to your state leagues, get hooked up with them, and they can point you to schools who have directors who are sympathetic to your cause. If you talk more about culture versus competitive success, that does tend to win over a lot of teachers, because something can I, I was very ask you a wary question? of. With Yes, go ahead. So as part of the high school league before, did you have a list of high schools and advisors that you could send to those colleges? Because I feel like that's one of the biggest gateways that I found is like we want we want the student information, but of course, student data privacy. But then we want to there's that third party, which is usually the high school advisor. And sometimes they don't have that whole list. And like, you just have to go get it yourself. It's like, oh, that's. That's hours of work, which I don't mind doing, but not everyone has their information out there. So that's a two part answer. First part of that is if you represent a university, state leagues will happily give you contact info for coaches and directors and programs. If you are a third party who is not educationally relevant, we've been approached by companies before that some random company, hey, can we have our student database for, for free? I'm like, no, F off. And so you need to find, if you're an educator, You'll be treated like an educator. 
If you're not, you'll be treated like an outsider because teachers are very, very, very protective of their students. And at so I actually did steer some students away from several universities who reached out to me for recruiting because they were not good places. It was either the school was academically very poor, did not fit them, they're trying to get, a, get easy money for college, or I knew that that program would not be a good fit for them personally. So talk to teachers first and they'll steer you still a lot better. So my answer actually goes off of Cora's answer. My answer will be short and sweet. And this is the best recruitment, uh, even engagement tactic that I've ever used. And it's reaped the best results, both for students that didn't decide to go to our program and students who did. And that is, there's one thing that we have differently than any other thing out there, right? right? Any other sports team, uh, any other engagement. And that is we can play online. So as long as it's okay with the high school coaches, get their students in scrims and in practices with your students. Let them hear it from a student perspective. Let them engage with the people whose team they're likely going to be on and let your students help you engage the students you're looking to bring in because that is the culture. It's not just... Uh, preaching culture it's showing culture and by showing that yeah. culture and engaging those students they're going to know whether or not they're a good fit on the team before they get to campus and i've went to recruit amazing students who i in my mind thought would be an amazing fit for what we were doing and they didn't mesh well with the team and that was fine i i pointed them to a college that i felt would be a great uh, they, they would thrive in and they would have great success in so that's the other thing if you're recruiting for numbers don't it, recruit for quality and not just quality of who you might think, but quality that makes sense for your program and, and for your team that's already there. Thank you all so much. We've got um, just a couple more minutes left. And in these last minutes, I'm going to give each of you one minute and I want you to uh, speed run this for you. To summarize this conversation that we have that we've been having today, and for those who, who will be listening to this to follow, please give out a piece of advice. What is the first thing that you should recommend fellow coaches and directors prioritize when it comes to building programming like that? What we have talked today. 60 seconds, each of you. I'm gonna start with Jackie. Chase, you're gonna be last because I know you're gonna need to be concise. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be blunt and just say you need to start your planning probably a half a year, if not more, a year in advance. Even if it's just collaborating with a committee, getting four to five people together, you need that time to plan. Do not try and create an event that's a week later, a month later, that it, it won't be as successful as you want it to be because there are so many factors. Start planning at least six months to a year in advance. Yeah. Thank you so and much, then, Jackie. Cora, go. For uh, on my perspective, like if you want your events to appear genuinely well-intentioned, you have to be genuinely well-intentioned. Especially in the collegiate space and in the academic space, people can sniff out someone who is not the right fit for what they're trying to do. If I try to appear one that I'm not, you're not going to get across for that. So we're doing programming for diverse groups on campus or for groups you don't know much about. If you appear unenthusiastic, that will seep through the event. If you want to, if you want to appear enthusiastic, be enthusiastic. And if you want to appear like you care, actually care. Well said. We don't run our events by ourselves. We, we don't, right? Pull them behind the curtain. It's not just us running the show. It's our students. It's our staff that are engaged. Make sure they are prepared for your event more so than anyone else anyone else they need to be prepared so my biggest piece of recommendation or biggest piece of advice biggest recommendation would be to have a boot camp at the beginning of your semester so that your staff and students are aware of the expectations and how you're going to engage your local community both on your campus and off your campus and prep them for those conversations because an interested parent isn't always going to approach you you're going to be off running doing something someone spilled something on a pc and you're fixing it they're going to talk to the student that's standing there and make sure that student is well equipped for that conversation well thank you all so much for that wonderful insight and 
I want to thank everyone who's been watching for today and for those who have tuned in for the past three days for the Coaches and Directors Summit. Um, this is aptly timed as we begin a new school year. We welcome everybody back to a fall semester and to all the excitement and the stress and the magic that comes with a new year, new us, new programs, new students, new activities. And I hope that everyone that has been listening has learned something a little bit newer. And for those that are here and to our panelists as well, I encourage and invite everyone to hop into the Esports U Discord tonight, um, right, following right here now on the hour, if you're available, and have a chance to talk with some of our panelists that we've had over the past couple of days and ask some questions, just hang out and get to know the other members of your community. Thank you all so much for attending the Coaches and Directors Summit 2023. It has been such a joy and a pleasure. Till next time, friends.